and endureth to the end, the same shall be blessed, yea, much more blessed than they who are compelled to be humble because of their exceeding poverty. That young man with whom I spoke recently was one who had done more than put away food and little savings for the misfortune which living prophets had warned would come. He had begun to prepare his heart to be worthy of the Lord's help, help which he knew he would in the near future need. When I asked his wife on the day he lost his job if she was worried, she said with cheerfulness in her voice, no, we've just come from the bishop's office. <laughs> we are full tithe pairs. Now, it is still too early to tell, but I felt assured, as they seem to be assured, things will work out. Tragedy did not erode their faith. It tested it and strengthened it. And the feeling of peace the Lord has promised has already been delivered in the midst of the storm. Other, other miracles are sure to follow. The Lord always suits the relief to the person in need to best strengthen and purify them. Often it will come in the inspiration to, to do what might seem especially hard for the person who needs help themselves. One of the great trials of life is losing to death a beloved husband or wife. President Hinckley described the hurt when Sister Hinckley was no longer at his side. The Lord knows the needs of those separated from loved ones by death. He saw the pain of widows and knew of their needs from his earthly experience. He asked a beloved apostle from the agony of the cross to care for his widowed mother who would now lose a son. He now feels the needs of husbands who lose their wives and the needs of wives who are left alone by death. Most of us know widows who need attention. What teaches me is to hear, as I have, of an older widow whom I was intending to visit again as soon as I could get the time, I thought, having been inspired to visit a younger widow to comfort her. A widow needing comfort herself was sent to comfort another. The Lord helped and blessed two widows by inspiring them to encourage each other. So he gave succor to them both. The Lord sent help in that same way to the humble poor in Alma 34, who had responded to the teaching and testimony of his servants. Once they had repented and were converted, they were still poor. But he sent them to do for others what they might reasonably have thought was beyond them and which they still needed. They were to give others what they would have hoped he would give them. Through his servant, the Lord gave these poor converts this hard task. After ye have done all these things, if ye turn away the needy and the naked and visit not the sick and afflicted, and impart of your substance, if ye have, to those who stand in need. I say unto you, if ye do not any of these things, behold, your prayer is vain and availeth you nothing. Ye are as hypocrites who do deny the faith. That may seem much to ask of people in such great need themselves. But I know young, one young man who was inspired to do that very thing early in his marriage. He and his wife were barely getting by on a tiny budget. But he saw another couple, even poorer than they were. To the surprise of his wife, he gave help to them from their scanty finances. A promised blessing of peace came while they were still in their poverty. The blessing of prosperity beyond their fondest dreams came later. And the pattern of seeing someone in need, someone 
with less or in pain has never ceased. There is yet another trial which, when endured well, can bring blessings in this life and blessings forever. Age and illness can test the best of us. My friend served as our bishop when my daughters were still at home. They speak of what they felt when he bore his simple testimony around campfires in the mountains. He loved them, and they knew it. He was released as our bishop. He had served as a bishop before in another state. Those that I have met who were from his earlier ward remember him as my daughters do. I visited him in his home from time to time to thank him and to give him priesthood blessings. His health began a slow decline. I can't remember all the ailments he suffered. He needed surgery. He was in constant pain. Yet every time I visited him to give him comfort, he turned the tables. I always was the one comforted. His back and legs forced him to use a cane to walk. Yet there he was in church, always sitting near the door where he could greet those arriving early with a smile. I will never forget the feeling of wonder and admiration which came over me when I opened the back door at our home and saw him coming up our driveway. It was the day we put out our garbage cans to be picked up by city workers. I had put the can out in the morning, but there he was, dragging my garbage can up the hill with one hand while he balanced himself with a cane in his other hand. He was giving me the help he thought I needed when he needed it far more than I did. And he was helping with a smile and without being asked. I visited him when he finally had to be cared for by nurses and doctors. He was lying in a hospital bed, still in pain and still smiling. His wife had called me to say that he was getting weaker. My son and I gave him a priesthood blessing as he lay in the bed with tubes and bottles connected to him. I sealed the blessing with a promise that he would have time and the strength to do all that God had for him to do in this life, to pass every test. He stretched out his hand to grasp mine as I stepped away from his bed to leave. I was surprised at the strength of his grip and the firmness in his voice when he said, I'm going to make it. I left thinking that I would see him again soon. But the phone call came within a day. He was gone to the glorious place where he will see the Savior, who is his perfect judge and will be ours. As I spoke at his funeral, I thought of the words of Paul when he knew that he would go to that place where my neighbor and friend has gone. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. I have confidence that my neighbor made it through his trial and will face his judge with a joyous smile. I bear you my testimony that God the Father lives. He set a course for each of us that can polish and perfect us to be with him. I testify that the Savior lives. His atonement makes possible our being purified as we keep his commandments and our sacred covenants. And I know from my own experience that he can and will give us strength to rise through every trial. President Monson is the Lord's prophet. He holds all the keys of the priesthood. This is the Lord's true church in which we are with him, lifting each other and are being blessed to succor the fellow sufferers he places in our way.
In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.